Hello, everyone. My name is Robert Campiti, and I work for Career Services at George Brown College. This recorded webinar session is for you. It covers the topics of a resume cover letter and some tips on <clears throat> performing in interviews. Um, if you wish to reach me, you can contact me via email. You'll see my email address on the slide in front of you. You can also book one-on-one -on -one appointments with me through GP Careers to meet uh, in MS Teams on a one-on-one -on -one basis. <clears throat> a copy of the slides have been provided to your professor, so you can have these for reference um, moving forward. As well, I've created a copy of a resume and cover letter to go along with the presentation, the fictitious student applying for a uh, field education uh, position is, by the, is um, has the name Georgina Brown, and so you can use that as you follow along with the resume sections of the presentation today. At some point in the near future, I will be meeting with you uh, to answer any questions that you have based on the content. And so I look forward to meeting you uh, then. Okay, uh, so we have a bit of a learning agenda for today. So we're gonna talk about uh, creating your resume and your cover letter, tailoring it specifically for field placement or job posting, creating skills or accomplishment statements to describe your experience, whether that's placement or paid experience or volunteer, uh, as well as uh, some interviewing content, general interview questions, behavioral interview questions, and uh, virtual uh, interviewing. The uh, resume that I provided, uh, Georgina's resume, is a sample of a resume done in a um, chronological format, or sometimes it's called a basic stacked resume. Um, this is the preferred style of resume by most employers, uh, and so that's the one we're going to focus on today. The uh, employers prefer chronological style resumes because they are easy to read. It prioritizes things like your education and your experiences. Um, and it uh, translates really well into one or two pages. Okay, um, when thinking about uh, crafting your resume uh, or cover letter, or even for that matter, preparing for a job interview, it's important to have a sense of what skills and what experience you have uh, and what skills and experiences the employer may be interested in. When you're applying for a, um, a job through a job posting or using a job posting, um, that becomes the primary resource you're using to tailor your resume. So by tailoring, I mean, you're using the language of the job posting. Um, you are uh, picking out the individual skills and the knowledge that the employer is looking for from the job posting, and you're using that as a basis to construct your resume. Um, it's the same for um, crafting a resume for a field placement in that you are tailoring the resume to your skills, what it is you have to offer. So whether those are transferable skills or their knowledge that you've developed uh, through your program about your field, um, experiences that you've had that you feel the employer would uh, really like to know about you. And, and that is the basis for constructing uh, a resume that is tailored for whatever it is, the experience that you're looking for. So thinking about reflecting on what the employer wants. So in the case of where there may be no job posting, so in the case of field placement, you can still uh, research the organization, look at their website, things like their mission, their mandate, who are they serving, who are their clients, what sort of services do they offer? Do they have job postings listed on their website? So take a look at those. That, that will give you a sense of what sort of skills, qualifications, um, or um, you know, things about individual uh, individuals' personalities that they might like to have on their team or working in that organization or serving their clients. Okay, so let's um, take a look at uh, the resume more specifically. We're gonna start with the resume. Um, if you look at Georgina's sample resume, you'll see how it's laid out section over section as a stacked resume, as you see on the right-hand side of the slide. Some sections that you will have in your resume will be ones that are um, that you must have. So obviously contact information. You might have an objective or a headline statement. Uh, that is not compulsory. You don't necessarily have to have one. You may choose to have one or not. It's kind of up to you and we'll talk a bit about that. Same with the highlights of qualification section. You often find the highlights of qualifications on a 
chronological resume, but maybe you don't use one and that's okay. Your education and certifications or training uh, goes on your resume for sure. And then your work experience, and that can be organized in different ways. And we'll talk a bit about that when we get to it uh, on the resume. And then other sections, you might have volunteer section, you might have a section dedicated to field placement only, professional awards, um, extracurricular activities, different things. Uh, these can be placed on the resume um, if you've got them. Uh, and again, it's about tailoring to the opportunity you're looking for. So they really should be things that you feel that the employer is interested in. You know, you don't have an unlimited amount of space on the resume. It's typically one to two pages. And so you want to make sure that you, you make um, um, best use of the space and really provide value in terms of what you're telling the employer. Okay, so let's start at the top of the resume. So your contact information obviously is something that you need on your resume. Um, how you arrange it is up to you. Uh, I will typically bold my name on the resume. You can have your uh, street address or not, it's up to you. Employers uh, don't expect that you will be providing your street address on your resume. You know, we're, we're now uploading resumes onto sites, we're emailing them, and for the sake of protection of privacy, you may wish not to put on your uh, address on your resume. Uh, if you have a LinkedIn profile, many of you are working or building portfolios as part of your program, and so maybe you have a link to your portfolio or your LinkedIn profile that you'd like to put on your resume, and you can certainly put that in your contact information section on the top. That really adds value to your resume. <clears throat> if it is a resume for field placement, use your George Brown email address. Okay, the, uh, the next section of your resume is uh, maybe an objective statement or a headline. Um, again, this is uh, something that uh, is not mandatory, you don't necessarily need one, um, so you may not. I don't use an objective or a headline statement anymore. I'm always creating cover letters to go along with my resume. Uh, and the cover letter tells the employer what it is I'm looking for. So I, I find I don't really need an objective statement. I'd rather use that real estate on my resume for another purpose. I've got other stuff to say. So an objective statement is typically, or is a, um, a brief statement that tells the employer what it is you're looking for. So, you know, it could be that you're a, a child and youth care student seeking a position uh, and then naming the specific position. That's an objective. A headline or a summary is something that's a bit different. It can be longer. It's uh, typically up to four lines in length. Um, and the focus of a headline or summary is to uh, highlight some of your value as a candidate for the position that you're looking for. Um, so it could be years of experience, references to specific skills or knowledge that relate to the position. Like other parts of your resume, your headline or summary is tailored to the position that you're looking for. So what can you tell the employer that they would be interested to know? Remembering that your headline or summary is at the top of your resume. So when the, uh, their eyes hit the resume, they're really going to see that first after your name. So in this case, there's an example. Um, so it, um, this uh, Georgina here is communicating to the employer that uh, she's bilingual and she has experience uh, delivering programs for youth related to health, fitness, and well-being. And if you look at the resume sample, you'll see that she's uh, worked seasonally for the YMCA. So that's what she's referencing. And she also, like the objective, she ties it in to the specific position that she's looking for and where she's looking for it. So if you are going to craft a headline or a summary, um, you want to make sure that you add value to your resume and what you're communicating through that to the employer. Your education section is uh, should follow next. Um, you know, when you have more experience, uh, your education will typically fall to um, a location after your work experience because employers tend to, uh, that's what they're most interested in is the work experience. Um, but as students who may be looking for field placement, um, it is helpful for you to prioritize your education over your experience. Um, your education can be listed as on the slide. Uh, so I typically will bold the name of the credential and then you could have the start date, end date, or in this case, an expected graduation date, which is upcoming in the future. You wanna name the institution. So George Brown College, city province. Um, and then 
sometimes students will do um, coursework, so they may highlight specific course titles of courses they've taken um, uh, that relate to the particular job you're looking for. Maybe it's something you studied that you feel that you'd like the employer to know. You could put it there as a list of relevant courses and list uh, two or three of those. Um, or for example, in this case, uh, Georgina has uh, achieved the um, recognition for academic distinction. So she's indicated that and put her GPA. And that's a great place to put it on your resume. Employers love to see that stuff. Uh, if you have other education as well, maybe you've done some other post-secondary credentials, um, list them on your resume. All of everything on your resume that's listed, like education or work experience or volunteer is reverse chronological. So you are starting with your most current and working back. Um, so in this case, start with your current credential. And if you've got other uh, credentials you've earned in the past through education, just list those in your resume. Um, bearing in mind, you don't want to, if you've got a lot of education and a lot of training, um, you may want to break it up uh, into a couple of different sections. You could have education, which is your post-sec, and then you could have a training section, which is other certificates or training. You can sort of <clears throat> arrange that, but uh, you certainly want to get some of your work experience, placement experience on your first page. So uh, don't spend um, too much time or dedicate too much space uh, to education. Uh, <clears throat> if you use the highlights of qualifications, that typically will follow. Um, um, your uh, objective headline and your uh, education. Um, your highlights of qualifications is um, really a summary of your experiences um, that relate to the position. It is tailored like other aspects of your, uh, your resume. Um, so thinking about transferable skills, it's knowledge maybe that you've uh, learned in your program that's relevant, accomplishments, awards, technical skills, um, things like you've um, Microsoft Office or uh, communication technologies that we're all using now to communicate things like Zoom or Blackboard. These things can be put on the uh, your uh, highlights and qualification sections as well. This section isn't too long on the resume. So really you're looking at about four to six bullet points. Could be more, but you don't necessarily need to. So we can look at a uh, a sample here. This is Georgina's highlights of qualification section uh, for her resume. So what she's done in her first, uh, as her first bullet point is indicating a number of years of experience she's got. So she did work at the YMCA seasonally uh, delivering youth programming. And so that really for her connects to um, working with young people. And so she's started that off uh, her um, highlights of qualifications. She's put her Dean's List uh, uh, status there as well. She's listed some, uh, some important knowledge that she has and she's learned within her program. Uh, and that in this case relates to a specific position, um, a specific uh, position working in um, a, um, a residence um, or a shelter, a youth shelter um, was the um, position used to construct this resume. And so uh, what she's done is picked up some of the content, uh, some of the, the knowledge that the employer is looking for uh, in their candidates. And this is something that she has studied in her program. And so she's included this in her highlights of qualification section. So you can do that too, um, based on the um, knowledge that you've got and uh, what might be helpful uh, to know or to bring into your field placement uh, or your work. So computer skills, things I've mentioned, she's got other stuff. She's just saying that she's got a driver's license. Um, she has her vulnerable sector check, other things that may be conditions of employment, languages that you speak, et cetera. So you can, there's a lot of flexibility with this section, but again, it is tailored to the position. So thinking briefly about what you would like to tell the employer um, in this particular section, they might pique their interest, so they'll continue to read on. Okay. 
we're going to move into the experience section of the resume. So this is your work experience, placement experience, volunteer experience, you name it. <clears throat> this particular, these bullet points come from an article that was published within Charity Village. Um, and you'll have access to these slides. And if you click the Charity Village logo, it'll actually take you to the article. Um, I thought I would include this slide for you because the, the focus of the article was for um, students or individuals who may be looking to get uh, or to find work within social services, but may not necessarily have a lot of directly, a direct paid experience in the field or have a lot of experience that's unrelated. Um, and so really the, um, the takeaway from this particular article is that whatever experience that you've got that's related, whether that's volunteer, experience um, or it could be placement experience. Um, don't uh, de-emphasize it over paid experience if your um, uh, if your uh, paid experience is unrelated. So employers do value uh, volunteer work. Uh, and so the recommendation is that you treat it like paid experience. So you just need to indicate uh, in your experiences that it was volunteer or it was a placement experience. Give yourself a proper job title. Um, when you're describing your achievements or your responsibilities, uh, treat it like you would a job. Um, and you can also organize your work experience in a way that prioritizes the related stuff and de-emphasizes the unrelated stuff. So for example, you could have a work experience section called related experience, and you could organize your placements, um, your volunteer work in the field um, in a reverse chronological format. So again, starting with the most current and working back. Um, for those that are volunteer experiences, just making sure that the employer is aware you're um, uh, you are a volunteer, and then placing that as a um, as your priority or your top work experience section. You could also create a second work experience section after that one, and that could be just called work experience or other experience. And then with that, you could have uh, other jobs that you've had that are not related. Um, uh, and list those in a reverse chronological format, focusing on things like transferable skills. Um, so you do have some flexibility in how you arrange your work experience. But um, again, the focus here is don't de-emphasize your volunteer experience or your unpaid experience just because it was volunteer uh, or unpaid. Great, okay. So in thinking about your experiences, you know, what do you want to focus on in terms of <clears throat> what you tell the employer through the bullet points that you use to describe your work experience? <clears throat> so it's important to know what you have to offer uh, in terms of your knowledge and in terms of your skills. And as well, it's also important to have a sense of what the employer is looking for. So generally speaking, you can um, organize uh, skills in three three buckets, if we can describe it that way. So one are knowledge-based skills. So your knowledge-based skills are things that typically you learn formally through school. So that's knowledge that you're learning in your program. The other are transferable skills. And your transferable skills are just that. They're transferable from one um, experience to another. So that could be school. school, it could be work, it could be volunteer experiences. <clears throat> and then the last are personal traits or qualities about yourself. Um, so here's a bit of a breakdown, um, a breakdown of, of the different three different categories of skills. Um, the examples at the bottom are actually, they actually come from a job posting and that was the same job posting used to craft Georgina's resume. So that was a, a housing support worker. Um, and so you'll see under knowledge based skills, so things like um, knowledge of issues around marginalization and oppression, et cetera, um, knowledge of at-risk youth uh, languages. So these are things that are formally studied. Transferable skills, teamwork, leadership, communication skills. You have a sense of transferable skills of what you've got. Um, those, you certainly wanna highlight those in your resume as well, particularly from the jobs that may not be related that are going on your resume. You wanna add value no matter what you're putting on your resume. And then personal qualities. You'll see that in job postings as well. Um, you know, how you self, how you self manage. So flexibility, high level of accuracy, but also sensitivity, respectful, right? Um, going into a work situation, you're going to be working as part of a team, you're going to be 
um, serving the clients of the organization. And so they want to get a sense of who you are, what your character is like, because um, that's uh, just as important as, the, in fact, it's even more important than having the technical skills or the technical knowledge to do the job. So when you are crafting your, your bullet points to describe your experiences, um, you want to do that in a way that adds value to your application. Uh, and so typically we do that by crafting what are called accomplishment statements. So rather than just uh, stating duties that you did or responsibilities, um, stating um, in an accomplishment format actions that you took, uh, describing what you did or how you did something, and then where possible, telling results or giving results. What was the impact of what you did or what you intended to do? This is an accomplishment statement. Accomplishment statements are more focused on performance and the value you added to an organization rather than just reporting on yourself and telling uh, some uh, an employer what you did by describing um, a responsibility. <clears throat> So your accomplishment statements uh, typically start with an action verb. Um, if it happened in the past, you're starting with an action verb in the past tense. You're providing more details. So you're, you're describing what you did uh, or how you did something. And then you are, if possible, quantifying your, uh, your achievements. So is it something you can add numbers um, in, uh, in describing the results of your actions um, and the um, the impact that you had for the employer. Sometimes you can do this, sometimes you can't, uh, but it's helpful to, to think about it and keep this in mind when you are crafting your accomplishment statements for your resume. Um, so here's a formula that you can use to craft your accomplishment statements. So it's using an action verb to start off your bullet point, describing what you did or how you did something, and then what was the result? You know, what was the impact of what you did? Right? Again, it's, this is more performance oriented. You're telling the employer what the impact you had was in that particular experience, because that tells the employer what you can do for them, gives them a sense of um, what you can do in terms of work, what you're capable of doing, um, and then providing some evidence. Again, quantifying by adding numbers or qualifying where you're adding adjectives or simply just describing in more detail what it is you did or how you did something. Uh, this is a very good way to promote yourself as a, as a competent employee. So here's an example of a responsibility statement versus an accomplishment. Um, so the first statement, input customer orders into database. That's describing a responsibility or a task. Um, by qualifying and quantifying, we can convert that into an accomplishment-based uh, statement. So input 40 customer orders on a daily basis, consistently exceeding the average by 25%. So in this case, um, Georgina is able to add numbers, gives the employer a sense of what they can do, uh, describes what they did specifically, uh, adding um, they were inputting customer orders on a daily basis. Uh, so it, it gives the employer a sense of how much work you can do. look at another example. So gave various life skills workshops to agency clients. So that's a responsibility or a task statement. This is what I was able to do, or this is what I did in the job. So thinking about qualifying, adding more detail, and quantifying, if possible, we can do something a bit different. Facilitated engaging life skills workshops on topics including financial literacy, goal setting, and conflict resolution for groups up to 20 agencies. So here we see um, in this case, Georgina has been able to provide much more detail. We know the topics on which she can deliver workshops. Uh, we also know how big were the groups that she was facilitating to. We also get uh, have a sense of the feedback that she got as a facilitator. She achieved an, a 90% uh, excellent rating by attendees. So if you are able to um, uh, provide some extra details, think about what you accomplished and the impact you had and build that into your accomplishment statements. It's much more impactful uh, than simply describing um, a task that you did. Um, it's important to remember that in your head, you know what you did, but the employer does not. They need or are relying on your resume um, in order to tell them a story and nobody spends that much time with the resume. So if they're spending seconds looking at the resume, you need to be able to communicate um, 
things like accomplishments efficiently uh, and quickly. Uh, okay, another example here, um, utilized a variety of teaching methods, including guided imagery, process trauma, and hands-on sensory activities to facilitate learning processes. So it's simply, there's no quantifying here, so there's no numbers, um, but in this case, Georgina has indicated the intended result or the intended impact of the work she was doing. It's about learning, right? So this is actually a, an accomplishment statement also. So thinking about your work experience, thinking about times you made a difference, did you receive some excellent feedback at some point? Did you receive an award for a job well done? Maybe you organized an event uh, and it was successful and you can quantify that, um, you know, number of attendees who attended, you know, it was completed on budget. Um, you know, these things uh, are accomplishment oriented. They say a lot about what you can do and they demonstrate the skills that you're stating that you have. Okay, another example, and you can see it's been switched up a bit. So the order here is your ver result in the middle and then what you did and how you did on the end. You don't have to follow the same format. You can change the order of the sentence as long as it makes sense uh, and you're, you're communicating the, uh, the, the information that you want to tell. So in this case, the result or the intended impact was to create a safe or maintain a safe and nurturing environment for the kids and then how they did it by overseeing activities and providing guidance when, when needed, right? So this is also accomplishment oriented, just a bit of a different uh, um, order. And then a, a final example here of one <clears throat> um, where it's a, it's a technology. So it's uh, MS Publisher in this case. So using a skill or technique as well can be used when uh, creating accomplishment statements. So created a monthly newsletter, an MS Publisher, and then what was the result or the impact? It's to promote events and drive awareness of homelessness in the community. Also an accomplishment statement. Okay, when you are um, um, writing your uh, accomplishment statements and putting them on the resume, you can use a format like this. Um, so bolding your job title, whatever that was. So in this case, it's a placement. Uh, in this case, uh, Georgina has a placement experience section, which is dedicated to her field experiences. Um, you've got a date to the right, start date, end date of the experience, and then bullet points, three to five bullet points, depending on the experience. Um, and you'll see a combination here of numbers. Uh, these are some of these are accomplishment oriented uh, or uh, are accomplishment statements. Some of them are more um, um, simply a, a describing a responsibility or task, which is fine as well. Um, but doing a combination of both is, is more effective. Let's look at a, a different example. Uh, so Georgina has some work experience working as a customer service representative in a contact center. So you'll see the way the experience is listed. It's exactly the same as the previous one, a bolded job title, the name of the organization, the city, and then the dates, start date, end date of the job. Um, so you'll see lots of numbers uh, recognized with the customer service award. So there's an award out of 50 agents. So tells the employer um, that um, out of a team of 50, she was singled out for a specific award, so that's excellent. She has a bullet point around her workload, um, how many calls she takes, uh, and um, how she meets her performance benchmarks for the job. Um, so she's telling uh, the employer, whoever um, is reading uh, her resume, how she's been able to, how she's measured or evaluated within her job and what success looks like. So she's communicating that. As well, the first bullet point, um, so she's in a customer service job that's not related to 
um, social services in any way, but she's using language like active listening and solution focused approach to identify customer needs. And so this language she may have picked up from a job posting for the, the work that she's uh, looking to do in social services, and she's building in this language into her bullet points in how she's describing uh, what she did. And so this is also part of tailoring, right? Using the language of the job posting uh, in order to um, um, describe what it is you've got and what you, what you can do. Um, unrelated work experience, which is this, focusing on customer service, right? These are, or working as part of a team um, or working in a very busy environment. These are transferable skills that you can focus on for unrelated work. Uh, and so all work is valuable. Okay, the overall appearance of your resume, the, the natural um, margins for Word documents is about an inch. Uh, and so you'll, you'll just want to default to that. Uh, I don't uh, encourage you to sort of blow out your margins so that you're you know, being able to pack in more text. It looks too tight and you don't want to make it too long with too, too much information because um, nobody spends too much time um, reading resumes. Like if it's a paid employment situation, employers will literally say, spend seconds glancing over the resume. So you certainly don't want too much text. One to two pages in length. Um, can be one full page, one and a half pages, no longer than two. Um, but as um, new entrance into the workforce, it's uh, it's likely that you won't have a two-page resume. It'll be less than that. Uh, ensure that it's free of typos and spelling mistakes and grammar. So do have somebody pre proofread it to make sure it's free of that. It's easy for us to skip over the fact that there may be mistakes because we've read our own resume so many times, we just don't see them anymore. Um, again, as I said a few seconds ago, uh, in employment situations, employers are spending seconds reviewing resumes, so you want to make sure that uh, it's concise, it's professional, it's easy to read, it's not too long, um, and that it is uh, also optimized for applicant tracking, and I'll talk a bit about that now. <clears throat> so if you're applying for positions through... Um, uh, through websites. So if you're applying for jobs, let's say through TDSB, school board, other large institutions, multi-service agencies, government, you know, community colleges, uh, all of these institutions use applicant tracking systems. These are technologies that are literally scanning your resume for keywords. So when the HR consultant is putting out a job call for a job, um, they are keying in a bunch of keywords that they are, are uh, looking to see in a resume. And that usually is things like amount of experience, particular credentials, uh, keywords associated with knowledge or skills. <clears throat> uh, what the applicant tracking technology will do, it'll scan your resume and cover letter looking for these keywords. There's a minimum threshold of uh, content that it's looking to find. If it doesn't find what it's looking for, the resume is usually at that point uh, eliminated from the competition. Um, and only those resumes that meet the minimum in terms of uh, matchable content are moved forward to the next step, which would be for the human reviewer to, to look at your, your resume. And so applicant tracking, in order to optimize for applicant tracking, you wanna make sure that you're again tailoring using keywords from the job posting, um, minimize the amount of formatting, so no tables, no graphics. You want to keep it uh, clean um, and in a format that can be uh, scanned. So that's uh, typically your docs or your Word. It can be PDF, although some applicant tracking systems may not be able to scan PDF documents. In terms of what your resume should look like, for uh, optimization for uh, applicant tracking. You'll see Emma's resume on the left is a two column resume. Um, the, the way this is formatted is that your eyes are going down the first column, which is experience, and then you go back to the top and then you'll follow down the second column, which is education and skills. Um, with applicant tracking systems, they will scan resumes from left to right, which means that they may not be able to scan a two-column re uh, resume such as Emma's on the left. Um, and so it may mean 
um, when it's scanning and it's parsing information and it's copying it over, it may be reading junk and may just simply be eliminated or the human reviewer, if it gets to the human reviewer, they may just eliminate the resume. So you're better off to submit a resume that is the basic chronological resume that we are describing today, uh, such as Mia's, <clears throat> which is your stacked resume. It can be easily read from left to right and the information is can be it can uh, make sense, right? So just being mindful of that. If you are going in for an in-person interview uh, and you are bringing a copy of your resume and your, your, your cover letter in person, then you can bring in heavy stylized resumes such as Emma's, but for the sake of applying online, just uh, a chronolog simple chronological resume will do. Okay, so that is uh, resume. We're gonna shift to the cover letter and briefly talk about it. There is a sample of a cover letter for Georgina's resume. You'll notice it's the first document. The formatting in terms of the font, in terms of the headers is exactly the same on both documents. Um, and so you wanna make sure the documents match in that way. Um, cover letters are personalized documents. So the resume has no voice. You don't make reference to the self. You, you don't say I did this or I did that. Um, the resume is more objective. It's about skills and experiences, accomplishments. The cover letter can be about you, your values. It can be perhaps a personal connection that you have to an organization uh, or to a service or even to your field. What's brought you in to do the work that you are wanting to do? And you can tie that into your cover letter. It can be your story. Your cover letter does not... Um, um, can, so you can use pronouns, you can make reference to the self, such as I, but you don't want to use it too much because there's a tendency to do that. Your cover letter can include specific accomplishments that you're proud of, um, references to specific skills, references to coursework. Uh, all of these things can be tied into your, uh, your cover letter. Typically, there's up to four paragraphs on your cover letter. It is a single page, so you're not going... Um, beyond that. Your first paragraph uh, introduces yourself. Um, so you can see in Georgina's sample, her particular cover letter is written for field placement. And so it's really a follow up to a conversation that she had on the phone with an employer. And so she's thanking the employer for speaking to her on the phone and asks her to accept her resume and cover letter in consideration for field placement. So you can certainly do that. Um, And so you're indicating in your first paragraph the reason for your writing and why you are interested. In the case of Georgina's, um, she's made some references to the values of the organization where she wants to do a placement uh, and her, her own values. So this is something you, know, you could potentially explore doing as well. So she says, I believe my own personal values towards helping youth align well with Youth Link's philosophy that with the right support guidance and opportunities, all youth can achieve their potential to succeed. So it's making a connection between herself and the organization itself. Um, you don't necessarily need to do that. You could make reference to some of the skills and experience that you've got in your first paragraph. And then in the second or third paragraph is where you go into a bit more detail about your qualifications and skills. So references to specific soft skills, technical skills that you've got, certifications, I mentioned coursework or course content. The cover letter, like the resume, is tailored to the position that you are looking for. So it, you know, what does the employer want in terms of skills or you know, what it is that you have to offer um, that you feel would be um, of value to the particular organization or agency. Um, your cover letter is not a a regurgitation or repetition of the content that is in your resume, because your resume speaks for itself in that way. Um, however, uh, you can bring some of the highlights into your cover letter. So two paragraphs there. Sometimes one paragraph might be dedicated to experience, so that's field placement or work. You might have a second paragraph there that speaks to your experience in the classroom, so some of your learning that relates to the field placement. Or you could simply have one sentence, one middle paragraph, and then your last paragraph uh, would be thanking the employer for uh, reading or considering your application, reiterating your interest, 
um, a desire to connect further through a phone call uh, to respond to any questions that they may have. Uh, and that's really the cover letter. Okay, when you are uh, emailing your resume or your cover letter to an employer, um, you want to save your resume in a format um, such as PDF. The advantage of PDF, of course, is that it flattens the document so it won't change. So if somebody's using a different version of Microsoft Word, for example, it won't play with your fonts so that things uh, um, show up looking a bit different than intended. Um, save it in a, using a you want to, I would indicate my last name, first initial, and specifically what the document is so that the reader, if it's going to a manager, let's say, they'll know right away what the document is and they can sort of keep track of the document. So you want to make sure you label it appropriately. Your subject line should also be clear as to what it is. What's the purpose of your, um, your message? The body of the email, you know, don't copy and paste your cover letter because that's a separate document. And also employers won't spend a lot of time reading emails. You know, people get lots of emails so that they don't want a lot of content in the body of the email. So you could use something like, for example, the first paragraph of your cover letter, um, which introduces yourself and, and states your interest in the position, in a placement or the job. Um, so in this case, uh, Stephanie LeBlanc is the manager who's responsible for field placement at this particular agency. And you'll notice that the email is addressed to dear first name, last name. Um, <clears throat> just be mindful of using honorifics like Mr., Ms., Mrs. that you may not know uh, the particular honorific used by the individual or if they use one at all, because sometimes uh, people don't use honorifics. So it's okay just to use first and last name. If you've talked to the person and you've established that you're on a first name basis, um, you could use that as well. Although this type of letter is a professional one. So I think first and last name is uh, more appropriate in this case. So that's what I would stick to. And then um, send the email. Okay, so that covers us off for the resume and cover letter. I hope that's given you a sense of uh, how you might uh, approach crafting your own and some ideas on how um, you might uh, um, build an effective one. <clears throat> We're gonna shift to uh, interview skills and we're briefly gonna touch on, on interviewing. Uh, so like your resume, which is accomplishment-based, um, you really are doing the same in interviews by giving examples of your accomplishments. Um, so when you are responding to interview questions, um, demonstrating means you're actually giving examples where possible of where you've dem demonstrated a skill. So the interviews in that, this sense are also accomplishment oriented. So first we're gonna talk about general interview questions and general interview questions um, sometimes they're called traditional interview questions. They typically are open-ended questions that uh, ask the candidate um, to uh, kind of speak uh, generically. Um, they're not prompting you for necessarily specific information. It's up to you to decide how you want to respond to these questions. Uh, but typically, these general interview questions are focused on the job seeker's background, skills, and perhaps their values as well. So when you are responding to questions like, tell me about yourself, it's not asking anything specific. So it's up to you. What are you going to tell the employer in this case? How do you respond to this type of question? Gives the employer uh, opportunity to listen to you, how you sort of think on the spot what you might know about the organization or the position and what are your communication skills like, right? Um, it also tells the employer a sense of self-awareness and maybe what your values and your motivations are. And so this is really the purpose of these types of questions. Okay, so we're gonna look at a few of them. Um, so you'll notice the format of the slide in front of you. You'll see the little YouTube icon in the bottom right. There is a video embedded there. Um, so 
uh, what I'll encourage you to do is when you're reviewing the slides, if you click there, it'll take you to a short YouTube video with a demonstration of how to respond to the question. <clears throat> so I encourage you to do that. So tell me about yourself. When you are responding to interview questions, you're really looking at about two minutes or less to respond. You're not spending a lot of time. The best way to manage anxiety or nervousness in an interview is to prepare. Um, so I would definitely prepare this type of question. Um, you may have been asked this question in the past, as many of you are, so it may often come up for you. Um, so when they're asking you, an employer is asking you about, tell me about yourself. Um, typically what they're looking to explore is the professional you. It's about your skills and experience. Um, but it can also include things like your values. And maybe you've had a particular experience in your life that had brought you into the field of work that you want to do. And it is okay to bring that into your response as well. When you're structuring your response, um, you could use this formula if you wish to do so, the present, past, and future. So present is where you are now. So that would be, you know, you're currently a student. So I'm currently a student at George Brown College in the um, Child and Youth Care Program, et cetera. You could talk a little bit about coursework content, your interests. Your experience is the middle section. So that's the experience you've got. So field placement experiences, work experience, volunteer experiences, lived experience that you've got. You can certainly tie that in. All of this is tied to the position. You want to think about um, what is it you wanted to communicate to the employer about your skills and your experience that present you in a professional uh, and positive way um, that connects to both in terms of skills, but also in terms of your values, right? And then the future. Future is the position itself that you're looking for. So what is it about your experience in your education that makes you a good fit for the, for the, um, the employer? or for the particular agency or position. And so I encourage you to sort of end off on that note and tell that to the employer. So this is really, <clears throat> really how you respond to the uh, tell us about yourself question. This is also a common question is, what are your greatest strengths or what is your greatest strength? Um, <clears throat> again, the question is not prompting you for very specific information. It's up to you to decide how you want to respond to the question. When an employer is asking this question, they're looking for a few things. One, they're looking for self-awareness. So do you actually know what you're good at and what your strengths are? And how might these strengths be of value to the particular organization or the position that you are looking for? So you really need to think about these things. So it's important that you go in with a couple of strengths in mind and also stories to illustrate them where possible. <clears throat> so think about, um, you know, what are your strengths? Where have you been given, uh, you know, feedback about um, what you're good at? Thinking about the work that you're going to need to be doing or the work that you want to do. Um, or will do within the organization? What are the strengths or the skills required in order to do the job? So you may want to choose to focus on those. Your, um, um, the, the formula that you can use to respond to um, your greatest strength, let me just move the slide ahead, is this. Um, so thinking about your strength, if they ask strengths, uh, plural, so tell me about your greatest strengths, you can come in with about two to three uh, strengths that you want to talk about. Um, or if it's tell me about your greatest strengths, you'll just focus on one. Again, two minutes or less to respond to the question. Um, so I would prepare a responses um, to go in and to be able to speak to these confidently. So one is identifying the strength. The second is proof. Uh, and so how have you demonstrated or used that particular strength in, in, a, in a certain context? <clears throat> so maybe it was, you know, working as part of a team and you could cite an example of course projects um, or things that you've done through work experience, right? So giving a, a sense of an employer where you've demonstrated that, what is the evidence? And then the relevance. So based on your research and your understanding of your field, 
and maybe the organization or the job, um, how is that relevant to the particular position? So I know in this position, you're really looking for somebody who has strong communication skills. And so I really feel that I'm a good candidate for this position, something like that. So tying it back to the actual position itself. The STAR method that's referenced here on the slide, we'll get to in a bit when we talk about behavioral questions, but there's a sample video that's embedded in the slide. So I encourage you to check that out. The opposite of the, what are your strengths question is, what is a weakness for you? What is your greatest weakness? Or what is a professional weakness or area for improvement? Again, it's similar to strengths, but sort of the opposite. Um, again, they're looking for self-awareness. Not everybody is good at everything. So you certainly have weaknesses as, a, as do I. And so again, it's up to you to decide how you want or choose to respond to this question. So typically, um, you're going to give one uh, weakness or area of improvement. So again, there is a formula you can use, and there's an example video here. <clears throat> um, so you can approach this in a couple of ways. One might be, you know, perhaps this is something in the past where you were learning something, you did something, you failed, you learned, and now you've sort of overcome that uh, um, the, the challenge and you know how to deal with that situation in the future. Um, and so it can be an example from the past and that's a good way to do it. Um, when you're selecting your weakness, uh, you don't wanna select a, a weakness that might be a key skill related to the particular position because that might um, cause the employer to doubt your ability to do the job. So it shouldn't be too close to the actual responsibilities of the job. Um, and sometimes there is a tendency for people to respond to this question by selecting something that's obviously not a weakness, that is something that's really an asset and trying to frame it as a weakness. Like, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm such a perfectionist that, although perfectionism isn't really a, a strength, it, it, is a, it is something that's, that certainly can be a deficit. So I wouldn't use that as an example, um, you know, but I have such attention to detail that um, sometimes it takes me longer to complete tasks, et cetera. Um, those tend to be cliche and employers can, can see through those things. Um, so it could be something like, you know, to give an example, something like speaking in front of groups. This is something that you've, um, your early experiences were that it was very anxiety provoking and you struggled with this. Uh, and so, you know, maybe the action that you took in order to overcome this, uh, this deficit or weakness was, I took a speaking with confidence course in my second semester and it uh, um, um, prompted me to craft speeches, to practice delivery of them in front of the class, to give feedback, to receive feedback. You know, and from that experience, you've learned certain skills and techniques to be able to manage the anxiety, to be able to do the work. So moving forward, um, although speaking in public is, um, does make you nervous, you, you have the um, tools in place in order to, to manage and to be able to do that. So it's demonstrating your learning. Um, th really the value for giving these types of stories from the perspective of the employer is um, they want a sense that you have some awareness as to where your areas of improvement are uh, and that you are able to deal with them and overcome them so that they don't become barriers in the future because there are tendencies where we're not comfortable with something or we're, we're aware that it's perhaps a weakness for us so we just avoid it entirely. Um, and that can be a barrier uh, in the workplace and in other aspects of our life. So they want a sense that you're able to overcome it no matter what it is. So I encourage you to watch the video and think about something and be prepared to respond to that question. Um, <clears throat> so those are a couple of the general interview questions I would encourage you to prepare for. We're going to shift to behavioral interview questions. Behavioral interview questions are a bit different. Behavioral interview questions focusing on probing into a job seeker's past behaviors and performance. The reason why employers uh, like to ask behavioral uh, or use behavioral interviewing as a technique is that um, the most accurate predictor of future performance in a job is past performance in similar situations. So how you handled 
a situation in your past, whether that's through school or through other work, is a good predictor of how you're going to handle the same situation in their workplace. Um, and so that's really a behavioral question. So if you've been asked the question in the interview, tell me about a time when you had a conflict with someone. That's a very common behavioral question. So anything that starts with a prompt where they want a story from your past is behavioral. The, the formula or the method that we use to respond to uh, behavioral interview questions or really any other question where you want to tell a story is using the STAR formula or STAR method, situation, task, action, result. The, the, different, um, um, the different parts of the acronym, S-T-A-R, uh, prompt us to tell a story in a way that's organized, concise, can be done in a couple of minutes and tells the employer what it is you want to tell them. So let's kind of break this down a bit. So using the STAR method um, really prompts you to answer the question um, in a way that meets the objective of the question. Um, when you are thinking about your stories to, uh, to tell, um, when you are thinking about the stories that you want to tell in the interview, you want to ensure that the stories make you appear qualified and present you in a positive light. That's always important. And you want to be specific and following the STAR method will help you to be specific in telling your story. Um, behavioral interview questions are typically used to evaluate soft skills. And so the categories of soft skills that are evaluated this way include um, these particular skills, teamwork, problem solving, leadership, interpersonal conflict, pressure, and stress. Uh, and so you can imagine in the work that you're being prepared to do that many of these soft skills will be required in the work, particularly around conflict, managing maybe conflict situation where there's an argument with between two individuals, working under pressure, working as part of a team. You'll want to come up with stories. Uh, and typically you're going into an interview with, you know, anywhere from four to six stories to be able to illustrate some of the, the, the important skills that you, <clears throat> you'll need to have in the job. Um, and so I encourage you to um, craft the stories. One of the documents that I provided you is a behavioral interview uh, sheet. Um, so it's front and back. It has a list of the common soft skills and it has four sections, S-T-A-R. And so really it's a template you can use to fill in with your stories and you can use that to help you prepare for behavioral interviews. So to reiterate S-T-A-R, situation, task, action, result are the different uh, sections that you'll touch on when telling your stories. And there is a video here embedded at the, the link um, that will demonstrate this uh, particular method for you. So breaking it down for you, situation. So when you're, you're telling your story in an interview about uh, a skill you demonstrated in your past, it's the who, what, where, when, how. You want to be quite specific so the employer knows the situation and what was going on. So you want to touch upon all of those. Usually situation and task go together. It's kind of one thing. Um, and so the task means... Um, what it is you needed to do. So if it's a case of conflict, you know, where was the conflict happening? So, you know, in my second semester, I was in X course working as part of a team of four, um, you know, communication started to break down and it got to the point where we weren't communicating at all and the deadline was coming up and we needed to do something to sort of get things back on track. So you're setting a stage through the situation and then the task would be, you know, we needed to uh, overcome the situation and get back on track. And so your situation and task usually goes together. Your action is the most important part of the, uh, your response. So the action is what steps did you take in order to overcome the, uh, the situation? So what did you actually do rather than uh, what you would have done? Um, or how you would handle a situation, you are telling a story. And so the action is uh, really focused on you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I took initiative, I got my team involved, I took leadership. So it's not, you know, I told the professor and they sort of dealt with it, or I told my manager and they dealt with it. 
Um, it's what initiative did you take? It's about you. They want to know your learning and uh, what you did in order to uh, achieve what you did or to learn what you did from this particular experience. Your results. So, what were what were what was the impact? Right. So, was there a specific? You know, we completed the project on time and and got an A. Maybe it was a lesson you learned. So I learned in conflict situations that it's important to be assertive and deal with conflicts as soon as they come up and not let them fester over time. Otherwise, um, things can be complicated and things can actually get worse, right? So what was the impact or the learning of the situation? And that's kind of the moral of the story that you want to tell the employer. So S-T-A-R, two minutes or less, you wanna craft your stories and you wanna practice, 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 practice. The, the star star stories can be, or just telling stories in interviews can be difficult to do. It's easy to get derailed and just sort of keep talking and talking without um, getting to the point or giving them the result of uh, your actual efforts. So do your homework. Make sure you've got your stories ready to go. And practice linking your stories to the specific skills that you are looking to illustrate in your responses. Okay, so those are your interview questions, a quick primer on interview questions. Uh, so some of you may be doing video interviews, video interviews that have been very common up until this point, and we're all you know, fairly confident now, I think, in videos and technology, because we use it every day now to do everything. Um, the little graphic that you see on the slide in front of you is um, based in the work that the, the it's called the 30, 38755 um, uh, principle or rule. Uh, it was uh, created by Albert Marabian, uh, and he suggested he studied language, he studied communication um, and communication in different forms body language versus verbal language. Um, and what he said was, in depending on the circumstances, your body language and your tone of voice can communicate a lot more than just the words that you are speaking. You know, and so, and so you know this in you know from your own experiences in, in just general day to day communication. If somebody is angry, um, you know, if somebody is perhaps not being genuine, um, you know, or maybe they're sad. You can pick up the, the emotions behind their words through tone of voice and body language. And the same comes through in job interviews. So depending on how you're feeling, whether that's anxious or you're uncertain, um, these things can come through in an interview situation as well. So you wanna be mindful of your body language. Um, if you go into GB Careers uh, and click on resources on the left, um, you will see um, towards the bottom, a link for interview resources. And we have interview stream, and there's also a link there for LinkedIn's uh, website tool for interview. So it's an opportunity for you to actually record yourself doing responding to interview questions that they can provide for you. The LinkedIn one will actually give you count your ums and ahs and give you feedback. So it's good to actually do a mock interview and we could support you with that or record yourself and be able to watch how you are performing and what your body language and your tone of voice is, is communicating to the group. <clears throat> so really treating your, your video interview like a real interview in many ways. So you wanna show up on time. You wanna greet each person on the interview panel if it is a panel, being mindful to smile, um, making sure that you are um, your space is is quiet uh, and things like your phone, because you may have your phone next to you, is turned off or in airplane mode so you're not being distracted by your devices and you certainly don't want to look at your devices. Um, <clears throat> you know, depending on the agency, the organization or the people that are interviewing you, it may be an interview that's more formal or less so. Um, if it's more casual, then you know, assume the demeanor of the uh, people who are interviewing you. So if it's more a casual environment, it's more casual in terms of com uh, conversation, it's okay for you to reflect that. If they're more professional in, in that way, then that's something you want to reflect as well. 
treat it like a, a regular job interview. So you certainly want to dress professionally um, for your, uh, your interview. In terms of the communications, and you've probably learned this by now, that uh, it can be a bit different in communicating verbally through video. Uh, and so there tends to be more longer periods of silence. So once you're finished speaking, it's okay just to stop speaking. And that's the prompt for the other person to sort of take over or speak. Uh, don't get overwhelmed by the silence and feel that you need to continue speaking just because there's silence. If you have completed what you've said, what you wanted to say, and you're done, just simply be quiet and uh, and let the uh, the next person speak, uh, or just prompt them that you've finished responding to the question, and that's okay. Being mindful of your body language. So if you are at home, right, it's easy. You know, we're comfortable in our own home, so you want to be spinning in your chair if your chair is on wheels. Um, or arms crossed or slouching. You really, it's helpful to have this mindset that you're actually in the workplace having the, the interview there. Um, and so some things to keep in mind. After the interview, thanking the interview, the interviewers, and then uh, sending a thank you email after for the opportunity to interview. And that's essentially the same as, uh, as an in-person interview. <clears throat> so your background is clean and neat uncluttered. Um, for your use of lighting, what I would suggest is your lighting, you are front lit, so you've got a, a lamp or something in front of your computer um, as opposed to behind you. If you put the lighting behind you, it'll cast you in shadow, so if you have a window behind you, it might be hard to see you, so make sure you kind of look at yourself and what the video image you're projecting looks like because you, you want it to be uh, to be bright. Particularly if you might be using video tools as part of your job, they want to make sure that you actually have the appropriate setup. Make sure you're in a quiet space where you're not interrupted. There are no pets uh, in your space. Um, and certainly make sure your space is uncluttered. You don't want to give an impression that, um, you know, that your space or your area is untidy. That's important. Make sure your tech works. So whatever video platform or technology they're using, you've got it. You know how to use it. Practice with a friend if you need to. If you need to move to be closer to your Wi-Fi so that you're, you're not cutting out because likely they'll want your video on. So that uses up more bandwidth. So you want to be prepared in that way. And of course, no distractions. Uh, good questions to ask. You want to make sure that you do have questions. They will ask you, you know, do you have questions for us? Um, so it's up to you to decide. You know, a good thing might be, you know, can you tell us if it's a field placement? Um, can you tell us what the onboarding might look like for field placement? Or will I be supporting a team or multiple people? Will I have a particular individual that I'll be reporting to or working with who's responsible for my learning or my training? You know, how will I receive feedback? Um, you know, is there a possibility to uh, to shadow or to um, uh, participate in some way with different aspects of the service or different programs within the service? Um, these are all valid questions you can ask. You know, what's the next step in the recruitment in the recruitment process for your field placement students? You know, will will I be receiving a call, and when will that happen? These are all okay questions to ask. You want to show interest. You know, a question, a general question that might be something that you want to ask is, you know, how has um, pandemic circumstances impacted your services or impacted um, um, the needs of your clients? Um, because this is, we're all sort of learning this together, right? How has uh, pandemic impacted the world in different ways? And so this is also a good opportunity for you to kind of learn um, and, and it's information that you may be able to take forward into other um, job interviews. Uh, and so that is it from me today. So this is a long one. So you've got the video, so you can start and stop as needed. Uh, and so I look forward to uh, meeting you to answer any questions that you may have. So I wish you um, to um, uh, good luck and take care of yourselves. And uh, I will... Um, See you soon. Okay, bye for now.